Our first segment, and I lost my notes here already. <laughs> I'm going to not then, pay attention to it because... That's, I think that's the best thing to okay. do is just not pay attention. And then I'll just edit it so that it makes me look smarter than you. Okay. I feel like who art ed. I'll try to slice it. Who art ed? Mr. Wood art ed me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's a big It works on so many levels. I know. I thought the great start. Welcome. In every episode, we are going to look at art in three parts. In situ, where we're going to look at the context in which it was created. In gallery, where we're going to have a discussion closely examining one specific masterpiece. And finally, in studio, where we will share our takeaways. Today, I am here with the wonderful, as always, Mrs. Wong. Happy to be here, Mr. Wood, and thanks for inviting me. Now for our in situ segment. It just gives us some context. It's about the artist and where this came from. Where this all came from. Today we're looking at Katsushika Hokusai. Hopefully I got that name right. Although apparently he had 30 different names in his lifetime. Um, And I guess that was a common practice for that time. Japanese artists would change their names or go by various names throughout their careers. Um, And when I say at that time, I guess I should say what time we're talking Mm -hmm. about. Hokusai was a Japanese artist born in 1760. And um, the famous work we're talking about here, The Great Wave Off Kanagawa, was a woodcut print made in 1830 or thereabouts. While commonly I will see it uh, listed as part of his 36 views of Mount Fuji series, I've seen other sources that say it was part of a series of 100 views of Mount Fuji. And even one listed it was a part of a three-volume collection, 100 views of Mount Fuji, which actually included 102 views of the mountain. So I'm going to go with what the Met says, which lists 36 views of Mount Fuji. Either way, it seems like it is a lot of views of that mountain. Okay. Did you know, uh, I have visited, uh, there's a whole gallery of um, some of these wood, what did you call them? Wood. The woodcut prints. The woodcut frames. And one of the things that I learned about the artist when I was walking through that, we just went last summer, um, was that he was actually adopted. So maybe that explains why he changed his name. I'm not exactly sure. But that was one of the things that I learned about the artist. That's interesting. And that, that I never was, knew that he, he was, was adopted. adopted. Um, I did not know that. I did know that some of the names he went by, um, I'm going to totally mispronounce this, but Gakio Rojin Manji was apparently the name he was going by at the time that he um, made The Great Wave of Off Kanagawa. And that is roughly translated to old man mad about art, which I just find delightful that he is choosing to call himself the old man mad about art. (laughs) So how old was he then? He would have been around, let's see, 1760 to 1830. So he's about 70 years old at that time. Right. Um, And did he live in Tokyo? Did he live or did he live near the shore? I believe he was from Edo. Okay. Edo, 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 E-D-O. Not going to yeah. pretend that I know I any know Japanese. Either. I don't know the pronu- yeah. pronunciation. I just wondered if he lived by the sea and if he was inspired by something that he saw. Or... This was the time when um, the, the Yukioi painting um, style, the art style, uh, which roughly translates to like images of the floating world was popular. And in that, you see a lot of sort of idealized landscapes that seem very peaceful and tranquil. And you also see a lot of like... The idea of these floating world images were sort of celebratory of just like the the pleasures of life, the daily pleasures and things like that. Well, this Um, is quite the contrast. I know. Okay. Now for our in-gallery segment, we're going to have a discussion looking more carefully at one piece. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking like, that is a terrible day for those fishermen. Right. Like, imagine you wake up, you're thinking, okay, I'm just going to go out on the ocean. I'm going to catch some fish. And that tsunami wave, the tsunami wave that is larger than the largest mountain. That's what I was wondering, because I'm sure it's the perspective that it's from so far away. But it does seem um, significant, the size of the mountain relative to the wave. And I wonder if that was the um, his intention, to be able to show relative to Mount Fuji. Yeah, I well I think there's I think there are a few things in there because like I think of 
Mount Fuji and the and the the tsunami wave almost as metaphor mm-hmm. in some ways where it's like, you know, that mountain that is that symbol of stability and the highest testament to something um almost eternal mm-hmm. in as a stable presence in your life is there. But that, that to the up- tumultuous, yeah. um, the churning and that, the, all the froth on the wave, and it almost looks like there that there's tentacles coming out of the wave. Looking to from this perspective, it almost looks like it could devour yes. the mountain and take yes. over. And- it looks like it looks like the mountain is in like the in the jaws of mm-hmm. that wave. Exactly, and you know it it in some ways could be read as metaphor for like how mm-hmm. that thing you see as so stable and eternal, there is something that can upend that. Even, exactly. You know? Exactly. And I also think, like you say, there is a little bit of linear perspective there. There is there is that sense of depth because of the fact that not just the not just the wave is larger than the mountain, but the boats and the people. If you look at those proportionate to the mountain, that shows a little bit of scale and depth to show that that mountain is clearly far away because we all know Mount Fuji is significantly larger than the largest boat that they would have created. Right. Um, right. I've I've also just pictorially found it interesting how there's um, the wave that's in the foreground that's not quite cre- uh, cresting and crashing yet. Mm-hmm. It almost sort of feels like a mountain peak to me. Oh, interesting. It does look like because it doesn't have the tentacles like or the fingers that are yeah. reaching out to grasp the fisherman. And it does kind of look like it's just a snow capped peaceful peak. So I didn't notice that before. But now that you pointed out, I can definitely see it. It kind of is the mirror almost of what's going on in the background with Mount Fuji. What, what's jumping out to you about it? Um, there's often a lot of tranquility right before because the sea is almost like glass before a tsunami comes in. In fact, all the water actually recedes from the shoreline. And so this just looks like an extreme, like a personification of almost just this hand coming and scooping everything up or a, or an eagle, like the talons coming and reaching down and just taking, devouring everything almost like prey to, you know, to grab everything in its path. So yeah, I, I love that. Um, I think that is a really good way to to interpret this, like talking about what are we seeing here in the, the enormity of the wave, and then the connection you're drawing to the personification or sort of anthropomorphizing nature like that, more powerful than the people in the boats, it's more powerful than the mountain, it towers right. and looms over everything. And if you think about it, in Hokusai's time, you know, they're on a relatively small island. Mm-hmm. Japan has been hit by a number of tsunami waves in its history. And for for them, when they didn't have, um, you know, Doppler War- radar that's going to give them yes. that warning system right. in advance, it is, it is just this unstoppable force mm-hmm. that can come on almost without warning. I'm looking at the fishermen right now. Yeah. And it almost looks like they are unaware or they're definitely, they don't appear to be in any kind of terror. Yeah. So I just wonder if it is, you know, he was trying to also portray that it kind of comes without warning or it takes people when they are unaware of what is about to happen to them. I'm asking. Yeah. Because it, well, I don't see it, but I wonder if you see it. Well, so, I mean, Hokusai is obviously not going to come in here and correct us in any of our speculation, which leaves me feeling free to just wildly conjecture. Okay. Um, But, like, as I'm thinking about it, I think a couple of things. One, I think those fishermen probably went out on the water thinking this is going to be a great day. Mm -hmm. The sea looks peaceful. Right. And they were probably caught off guard. Right. Um, the sky kind of tells you that too. Like there's, it doesn't, yeah, it was the probably sky like, is just it was, peaceful. Yeah. It, doesn't it was look probably like, like an early morning, yeah. you know? And, um, you know, the other thing I think about just from like the artist's perspective, I think this is a woodcut, you know, mm-hmm. a woodcut is essentially, it's a giant stamp carved into a block of wood. Mm. So what Hokusai would do is he would, he would make the drawing and then it would be given to a wood carver to make the block. And, when I think about things that are being printed, I always think simplicity because of the fact that it is a very labor intensive process. Um, at that time, like a typical woodcut, you would be talking about a different block of wood being carved for every color within the composition. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. The See, fishermen this is are I'm, the same color is, as the, the most intense part of the wave. 
it. Yes, which probably has a couple of like you could look at that as like a metaphorical connection between mm-hmm. the two. There's also just the practical possibility that maybe he is trying to distribute his colors okay. and, and balance the composition and simplify things by doing those color separations and thinking about like, okay, well, they can't be the blue of the water. Right. You know, they like what color are they going to be? There they are have to only stand like out three from... colors in this. There are yeah. only just the tans and the, the blues and then just the white. So the blues we actually see, if you look carefully, there are two blues. Mm-hmm. There is an indigo and there's a Prussian blue, right. um, which I absolutely love that combination of those two different blues and those subtle highlights on the water. I mm-hmm. feel like that makes the piece. Mm-hmm. I feel like that that little addition that it's not just blue and white, but there are different shades of blue. I see it now. Yeah. I, I feel like that is what gives life to the to the water mm-hmm. and to those the waves and I, it gives it a little bit more dimension it gives it some highlights um and and if you think about it actually the wave is what is more defined than anything else right um it's it's um you know not just the scale of it but also the definition given to it and the detail given to it makes it stand out and um hold the attention more than anything else so i always like to end my in gallery segment mm-hmm. by asking like if you could take this and put it anywhere, where do you think this should hang? I guess I would say um, because it would definitely be much more meaningful if it were in a place where people could connect emotionally. I definitely could see it being like in the Pacific Northwest or any place. I mean, this is obviously in the Ring of Fire where this is, um, you know, something that they live with all the time. They live with this, you know, threat. Um, so I guess I would say more in that, in those places where people live with this, you know, it's just kind of an interesting thing to be able to, um, have them be able to experience this great work of art and, you know, they can connect to that and empathize with what it must be like to be in this, um, situation. That is so like beautiful and thoughtful and so much better than what I was going to say because what where I was going to say where would you want to see it I I would put this up like at the entrance to a line where you rent paddle boats because I just think of like this is the irony this, of it this, or? A, a little bit of the irony but also I just think of like like you know my kid getting out onto a paddle boat and I want to be like just remember you need to take this seriously because water can be a fun force, but a destructive force Very as destructive well. Force. I um, have a student gave me a journal and this is the image on the cover. So yeah. I don't know if it came from, you know, a, um, an art gallery or if they just found yeah. it in, you know, Target. But I've always loved this piece just it, um, it is a beautiful piece and it's actually very widespread. Um, you know, Hokusai was a very prominent artist in his day, and his his woodcuts and his prints were influential not just with other Japanese artists, but um, his contemporaries in Europe. Um, again, we're talking about 19th century, so we're talking about artists like the Impressionists, Van Gogh, mm-hmm. Monet, Manet loved it. So he's yeah. their contemporary? He's the same then? I mean, he was around the same period. Okay. He was a little bit earlier. Okay. Um, imp- the Impressionist movement was like mid to late 19th century, whereas Hokusai was early to mid 19th okay. century. But they um, they looked at and collected his work. And like I said, I know you like Degas. Degas was very much influenced by the way that Hokusai would have – he would depict people in sort of natural actions mm-hmm. instead of carefully arranged poses. Gotcha. And we see that in a lot of that impressionist work that is trying to capture just what's happening in that moment, right. that ephemeral. And who, I And who isn't in awe of the ocean? Anyways, I mean every the the ocean is such a symbol of, you know, peace. Like what can you listen to if you're having trouble falling asleep is you can listen to waves lapping. You can get that, you know, soundtrack. Yeah, Everyone and- loves the you know, the ocean. Yeah. And that's one of the things I like about this is I always look at this. And to me, there's like this inherent tension to the composition because Mm -hmm. on the one hand, there's that obviously destructive force Mm -hmm. that is coming, crashing down over, it is looming, like it is the sword of Damocles over those fishermen. 
And at the same time, you pointed out there's this there's this almost stillness and tranquility. It's almost like resignation or acceptance Mm -hmm. that, you know, we live in a turbulent world. And also, as I look at this, the balance of the composition, like I see all these lines that are leading my my eye in almost a circular path, which like the roundedness feels Mm -hmm. a little bit tranquil. And it almost looks like it almost looks to me like a yin yang sort of a symbol oh, between I see the sky it now. and the waves. For sure, the clouds. There is that there's mm-hmm. that balance to it. And in some ways I think of sort of like that floating world idea as just like yes, there are these earthly pleasures, but also it's ephemeral. It all seems to be wrapped up in in this, which is why I think this is the standout of the 36 or whatever number of um prints hokusai made of mount fuji and now for our in studio segment in studio think about what strategies are working take it good artists your own great artists go ahead steal this art make it your own these are the takeaways this is what you can apply to your own work so as i look at this one of the things that i notice is what I refer to as the leading lines. Um, in art, we talk about movement as a principle of design. Okay. And when we talk about movement, we're not talking about the the work physically moving. Like that that wave has been ready to crest for um, you know two hundred years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, the movement we talk about is the way the viewer's eye moves around the the picture, and the human eye naturally follows lines. As, and as I look at this, the contrast of those white. Um, peaks on the mountains, mm-hmm. it creates this pathway for my eye to go. There's this sort of circular path for my eye to follow. And that holds my attention. Moving away from like the technical components, I think one other te- takeaway I have for this is, you know, when creating a composition, I think it's really important to create drama and action. Mm-hmm. But we're not seeing the waves crushing the boats we're seeing the wave about to crash on the boats Mm -hmm. and it's that sort of potential energy it's that we're we're anticipating what's going to happen next that i think draws me into this picture i like that it's so interesting because you know if you draw it back and connect it to what we were talking about a minute ago with the impressionist a lot of their pieces seem much more almost static Like they were trying to have you feel what it would be like just in a moment of time, like a breath or something. But this is really the anticipation of what is to come. Like you said, the potential energy of it. But to me, like the the movement across the sky in Starry Night feels so much like that tsunami wave cresting across there. I Uh, just see the simplicity also when you say of... When you're talking about when you realize what is going to come, and yet his the lines are very simple. The way he's drawn the fisherman's boat, it's just very simple, and it really you know emphasizes, I think, almost the terror or the it, like you say the dichotomy of yeah. That. And I I think I think that's a good note to end on okay. is just the simplicity of it because I think one thing that often we forget is simple and clean can be very elegant. And simplicity and removing details makes something a little bit more open to not only interpretation, but it also makes it more open to people to connect to. Because we don't see necessarily the clothing that those fishermen are mm-hmm. wearing. We don't see the the detail the level of detail that tells us exactly who those people are, what time and what culture they came from. They became just symbols of human beings out on the water, Mm -hmm. which makes it a little bit more timeless and universal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the reason that this holds up, like I said, almost 200 years after it was made. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, Um, I just would like to thank you for inviting me to do this. And I would like to encourage everybody to, you know, occasionally step out of their comfort zone and try and talk you know, with somebody about art or poetry or something that you just have, you know, it takes a little bit more thought, um, you know, because this was definitely outside of my comfort zone, but I enjoyed it very much. And I learned something completely um, new that I can take away. So um, thank you for challenging me and inviting me. 
Well, I need to thank you for coming on to just my second episode that I'm trying to figure out the format for and always being up for helping with stuff. You know, um, you helped me with the national board. <laughs> you helped, you know, little things like, hey, you we might want to look one at another. The, you yeah. might want to look at the standards <laughs> before you write things. Um, but, you know, I, I appreciate that you were willing to step out of your comfort zone. And I hope also... While you say this is out of your comfort zone, I hope you realize you don't come across as someone who is out of their depth or out of their comfort zone. And I think part of that is because whether we've said it or not, what I'm noticing is there's a parallel between the way that you and I talked about this art, Mm -hmm. uh, this work of visual art, Mm -hmm. and the way that you talk about poetry, Mm -hmm. the way you talk about you know, a book that you are reading. We start by identifying what do we see. Mm -hmm. Then we start to identify what connections can we draw from that and what inferences follow that. Right. And just to have the ability to talk with somebody um, about the choices that an artist makes definitely can, um, you can get just so much more out of it. It's clarifying. It It sparks ideas and you make new connections. Right. in actively listening to what the other person is saying. Right. Because I've seen Hokusai's work for for years. Mm -hmm. I learned about it in an art history class. I, you know, did a little bit of research in preparation for this discussion. And still, I feel like I know it better now than I did Mm -hmm. as I was reading about it, as Mm -hmm. I was hearing about it, because now we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. And that forces me to clarify my thoughts and also hear a different perspective on it. So thank you very much. Thank you. I learned something. Thank you.